Hi, I'm Mike Olinger. I'm the state director for AARP North Carolina. I want to thank you all for being with us uh, live. Those of you who may be with us at this moment or those of you who are watching this after the fact, uh, welcome. Really appreciate you spending some time with us today to learn about voting here in North Carolina this year. As you may or may not know, there have been some major changes that have been, have been, have been put into effect. And uh, for the first time, they're going to be uh, affecting uh, the entire uh, voting population uh, with this general election uh, coming up in November. And for those who uh, decide to uh, participate in the primaries in March as well. So today, uh, we've got a, a couple of guests who are going to be joining me today. Um, one is Karen Brinson-Bell, who is the Executive Director of North Carolina State Board of Elections. Uh, we've had the opportunity to work with uh, Karen before, uh, appearing on a radio show a couple of times to talk about voting in North Carolina, and she's provided so much great information uh, that we're delighted to have her back with us yet again. Uh, we're awaiting uh, her to join us via video here momentarily. I also have uh, with us here at ARP North Carolina, Chris Brandenburg, who is our Associate State Director for Advocacy. Um, he leads AARP North Carolina's voter engagement efforts. And um, he's with us to answer a, a couple of questions that we, we may get um, in our chat. And those of you, again, who are going to be following uh, along live here, um, do feel free to take advantage of that opportunity if you have any questions. Uh, related to ARP's efforts around educating folks, uh, please direct them to Chris. Um, and those of you who have the bigger, broader questions related to the primary, voter registration, deadlines, etc., cetera, uh, please direct them to Karen Brinson Bell. Um, so it's a, a great pleasure for me to, to introduce uh, Ms. Bell with us. She's the executive director of the State Board of Elections. And uh, Karen, as you were logging on there getting on, on our video feed here i mentioned that you've been a guest with us a couple of times it sure certainly isn't our first time uh working together on uh, helping educate north carolina voters about uh, what they need to know um those of you who don't know we do a weekly radio program here out of the triangle called arp without limits it's uh broadcast by wptf on sundays every sunday at 1 p.m and we also post it uh, um, as a podcast available for anybody anytime to download and listen and enjoy and uh, karen's been with us twice since our show launched a year or so ago and here we are back again karen doing it again this time on facebook live so it's so good to see you virtually uh though we prefer it in person for sure thanks for being with us glad to do it and i i always claim i was the inaugural guest on your podcast so uh that's right or your show that's right. so, um I, I take that with pride and i'm sorry i'm a little bit late logging on um i will say that i had to go at, at it three different ways because we have that many security parameters in place so that should be some reassurance to everybody of how secure our elections are <laughs> <laughs> well said and we really appreciate you making the extra effort to be uh to be with us so karen let, let's go ahead and get started right with you we really value your time with us today um, for those who don't know, you know, people have heard about Board of Elections, and I'm sure, I know for, for sure there, there is confusion about what is the, the State Board of Elections, how does it work, who appoints the members, and so forth. Recently in the news, we've heard about possible changes coming in terms of members being appointed by the governor versus the state legislature. Can you please uh, start with some basics? What is the state BOE? What does it do? And uh, what's the latest on uh, these possible changes coming to uh, how appointments are made and so forth? Sure thing. So the State Board of Elections uh, is an independent agency with state government that has oversight of the County Board of Elections. Uh, the State Board is comprised of five members who are uh, recommended by the political parties and then selected by the governor to serve on the board. Uh, the board then selects an executive director. And uh, so that's how I came into this role, though I've been in elections since uh, 2006. I'm at my 18th anniversary uh, this week, actually. Uh, so we have oversight of 100 county boards of elections. Uh, those have full-time uh, election administrators on staff at the county board office and they work with a five member board also um, that come up from county board recommendation or excuse me, county party recommendations to the state parties. 
And then the state parties provide those to the state board and the state board actually appoints the county board members. Um, this is North Carolina set up for uh, decades now. Um, the state board and the county boards were uh, pretty well established in their current fashion uh, in the 70s. And um, there have been some different uh, laws put forward to try to change that configuration. Uh, but the courts have always stepped in. There is a, 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 a law that was passed, um, uh, Senate Bill 749, that was passed back in the fall. There was a case that went um, to a three-judge panel and there was an injunction. So those, uh, those boards have not been changed. Uh, if enacted, it would be that the state board would become eight members, the county boards would become four members, and uh, that so that's where the, the significant change is. Um, the governor would not be the one um, appointing based upon political party recommendations. It would simply be the uh, selections of the legislature and they would not um, be required to get their recommendations from the political parties. Uh, that is, like I said, there's an injunction right now and uh, there's gonna be some briefs and some decisions coming forward uh, uh, likely in in February, maybe into March. Um, but, you know, for the meantime, we're keeping with the structure that we've had. And uh, for some folks, this may seem a little different. Uh, North Carolina is one of only um, a few states uh, and territories that are structured this way. Uh, many fall under the Secretary of State, um, who serves as the chief election official in many, st in most states. Uh, but that has its own pros and cons. Many secretaries of state are elected officials. And so in our case, uh, we are an independent agency. Uh, we are not elected officials in North Carolina. Does that answer anything else you want to know, Michael, on that? <laughs> That's a lot. That's plenty. And we really appreciate it. And those who didn't catch any of that, I know they can just rewind the video after the fact. She'll be posted on our Facebook ARP North Carolina page. Thank you for that information. It's important to get the basics out there because there is so much misinformation about what the BOE is. And and then, of course, when it seems like every other week there's new news regarding voting regulations and laws and processes and, and all that, that it's easy for folks to get confused. Uh, speaking of that, uh, let's please, uh, if you could give us a, a, an update um, on what is going on regarding changes to how North Carolina uh, voters can vote regarding things like absentee ballots and deadlines uh, that folks need to know because things have things changed when we got into COVID, of course, um, and then they've moved back and then they tightened up even more since then. So uh, can you walk us through some of those changes that folks need to know about? Certainly. Yes, there have been uh, several provisions that have changed uh, in North Carolina law pertaining to elections that are voter facing, as I would say. There's there's been several things that have, have happened that deal more with how uh, we report things to the legislature, for example, or or something sort of behind the scenes in terms of how we need to administer. Uh, but I think there, there are really three key areas that voters are uh, mindful of. Uh, one, there were some changes to observers. Uh, there was also changes to uh, how we conduct absentee voting. And then uh, that connects uh, in terms of deadlines and with photo ID. Uh, photo ID impacted uh, both absentee and in-person voting. So I'll start with observers. Um, the observer uh, provisions uh, allow, we've had for years the ability for the political parties or uh, candidates in, in nonpartisan races to have individuals stationed at the uh, voting sites to observe what's taking place. Uh, there were some uh, some additional provisions added into the law. So it's not a new thing, but it is uh, clarifying or adding some uh, provisions on what's permitted and not permitted. And we've gone through both legislation and rulemaking pertaining to that. Um, it really won't affect the voter so much as uh, how the observers interact with our precinct officials at those voting sites. Um, we are still maintaining a, a distance for the observers from where the voter is actually marking their ballot or putting it into the tabulator. So voter secrecy is maintained. Um, we are at requiring them to wear a badge 
um, or identification so that the voter is aware that that's an observer uh, there because of the political party uh, and is not one of the precinct officials that has been trained and is serving uh, as one of the actual election officials at that site. Um, so those are some, you know, some things to be aware of in terms of observers. The, uh, you know, key thing with um, absentee by mail is uh, two particular things. Uh, we still offer no excuse absentee voting in North Carolina. So uh, if someone wishes to vote that method, they simply go onto our website, ncsbe.gov, and complete the online form requesting uh, a ballot. They put in some identifying information so that we can confirm that that is the voter as it appears in our registration records, and we are able to send out the ballot packet. They can complete the form, uh, print it out, and send it into their county board of elections or go into the county board and complete a request form. Uh, but the easiest method is to do that online. And then they actually can sign up for a service called um, uh, Ballot Tracks, where they can follow the sending of their absentee by mail packet in the mail uh, until it arrives at their home. And then they can also follow it from their home back to the county board of elections. And that's where another key provision uh, has gone into effect. Previously, North Carolina had a, a deadline uh, that it must be postmarked and then received within three days of the election. That is no longer the case. And we are required to receive those absentee ballots by 7.30 p.m. on election day. So they either have to be uh, delivered by mail to the County Board of Elections no later than election day or delivered uh, by hand to the County Board of Elections by 7.30 p.m. on election day in order for that absentee by mail ballot to be counted. Uh, so we do um, you know, really encourage voters to make sure that they get those ballots in the mail. Uh, a seven day grace period is, is ideal. Um, so, you know, you want to be mindful of that. The last day to request an absentee ballot is February 27th, but that's not much of a window for the county boards to turn it around, get it to your home or the, you know, where you want to choose to vote that absentee ballot or, and then for you to get it back to the County Board of Elections. And then the third thing, and then I'll take a breath, um, is, uh, is just photo ID in, is, is in general. So we have implemented photo ID and uh, that took place in the municipal elections. It is required for in-person voting in North Carolina as well as absentee voting. So someone who chooses to vote absentee by mail is asked to provide a copy of an approved ID uh, if they cannot, there is an exception form that's provided to them and they can indicate why they're unable to provide an ID, which could include not being able to make a copy. Uh, In-person voting, we require an ID to be presented and uh, that is whether it's early voting or on election day. There are many types of IDs that have been approved in North Carolina. Most folks will use their driver's license or DMV issued ID. Uh, but you can certainly use a passport, a tribal ID. Um, there are a number of uh, public employee uh, cards that are permitted. There are student ID cards that are in university ID cards, community college IDs that have been approved and that are permitted. So all of those are listed um, on our state board website, ncsbe.gov. And for specific information about voter ID, uh, it's ncsbe.gov forward slash voter ID. Uh, so I, I think I've touched base on what is uh, most pressing with this election for folks. Thank you, Karen. That was really great. Uh, and just so folks are clear here, basically they're wondering why is AARP doing this program? Um, I know how to vote and where to vote. And as she just laid out, there are some big changes. And the, one of the key things here is the timing of some of these things. So if you're in the old habit of, say, voting, you know, absentee and, oh, I know how much time I need to drop it in. Things have changed. They need to receive it by 7 p.m. on Election Day. And folks, that's enough. <laughs> 730. 730 p.m. Election 730 day. p.m. Uh, that 30 seconds may or 30 minutes may make a difference to some folks. Um, you got to plan ahead. You, you have to really have a plan for voting if you're not going to be doing it in person. Uh, even then you want to have a plan, right? If, especially if you don't have your own transportation, you want to be uh, be able to participate um, in the election. The other thing I want to ask, uh, Karen, you mentioned before all the different types of IDs that can be used for the photo requirement. 
um, we have been seeing in the news and in bits and pieces some outreach educating people that they can go and get a, a free photo ID if, if, if sort of some of these examples that you laid out uh, are not easily available to them. Where, where can uh, folks go to get an ID, a, a current photo ID if they currently don't have one? Yes. So while there are many types of IDs that are approved and permitted to be used in North Carolina, not everyone may have one of those. So it is permissible for you to get a free ID through DMV. Uh, so that's one option. The other option is to go to your county board of elections and we can make you a free photo ID. I'll show you an example. Uh, George Clooney is not a registered voter in North Carolina, but this is what a free uh, voter ID from a county board of elections resembles or looks like. Um, so that's an option. And then, you know, if, if none of that is uh, possible for you, there is provision within our law for a voter who presents themselves to vote, uh, who does not have the ID with them, but does have a proper ID. Uh, they can vote a provisional ballot and then take that ID into the County Board of Elections during the 10 day certification period. They actually have to do that before the 10th day. So nine days um, until we certify the election. Uh, also, there's an exception form for those who vote in person. So if someone uh, is unable to uh, has a reasonable impediment, so like they are unable to have transportation to get them to a place to get an ID, that would be a reason uh, to mark the exception form. They may also have a religious objection or there is the provision for a natural uh, disaster. Right now, knock on wood, we haven't experienced that. So that won't be necessarily a reason for someone to mark the exception form um, when they vote either in person or by, by mail, but um, that that is also on the exception form. So those are the, the key things. Either present an ex um, acceptable form of ID or go and get a, a free ID, either through the DMV or the County Board of Elections, or uh, there is the exception form that is provided to both absentee by mail voters or in-person voters if there's a reason that they are unable to have that ID. Great. Thank you so much for that, Karen. Um, we do have a, a viewer question here we're going to bring up here um, in a moment. And then after that, uh, oh, here we are already. Do you have to copy both sides of your license or ID? Very good question. Um, it, the key is for us to have uh, it, that it's legible uh, for your photo. So we're looking for that front side, but you know, it, it, I'm never going to say it's not a, good, a bad practice uh, or it would be good practice to just go ahead and copy both sides so that we know it's a, a, a complete valid ID. Okay, excellent. Better be safe than sorry for sure. Looks like we have another question coming from our Facebook. Is there any pending litigation you may think may cause additional changes to voting before November's election? Very good question. <laughs> we do have many pending court cases right now. We actually, um, with same day registration, that being an opportunity to register and vote during the early voting period because uh, you might not have uh, taken care of that or had some circumstance that changed your registration um, and you need to register, newly register. Um, there have been some provisions that have changed that even as recently as two Sundays ago. The judge sent down his order on a Sunday night. So we have been putting in a process to cure any deficiencies with same day registration which we also have in place with absentee by mail. And that was from a court decision back in 2020. So yes, North Carolina is always subject to litigation, it seems, around our election laws. Uh, and we do have some court cases right now. Uh, one that does not appear that it's going to affect, um, affect us is a decision came down uh, just a few days ago where it was a challenge to the Senate state Senate district maps. And uh, the judge said that it, you know, he was not going to put in an injunction or, or halt those maps. Um, and so there is an appeal for that. You know, whether the federal court will change that, um, hard for us to know. Um, but uh, traditionally, once voting has started, we don't see changes happen in our maps um, that would prompt a new primary or, or election. Um, so between now and, and November, um, we'll consider continue to see this uh, lawsuit play out regarding the, the appointment process for the state board and the county boards. Uh, we're likely to see 
you know, there, there's more uh, even on the federal level that deals with photo ID. Um, there's some things that even center around our maps um, at the federal level. So, uh, you know, it, it's hard to know. Um, but the courts generally are very mindful to not disrupt an election with their decision unless it's to the benefit of the voter. Um, but once voting has started, they tend to um, proceed cautiously before they, they make any significant changes. But, um, you know, once we're past the primary, they may uh, make changes that would affect November and we'll just keep you posted um, on that. And we encourage folks to follow us on social media. Uh, we do also have a um, a sign up on our website where you can get our press releases and, and other information that we send out via email. Um, so you can sign up for that. There's a sign up in, if you go to ncsbe.gov, the lower left-hand corner is where that sign up is. Um, and as far as our social media is concerned, uh, we have uh, social media accounts with Facebook, uh, Twitter, or now X, and also LinkedIn. Great. Thanks so much. A lot of great information. I'm really glad that you mentioned the uh, districts as well. Um, just a practical question uh, here. If somebody walks into uh, you know their usual precinct and discovers at that point that they're now in a new district, say for a, a congressional district. Um, what at that point? What is their their um, course of action that they need to uh, uh, take? Well. The thing we most encourage is for voters to go uh, vote prepared. So the best way to do that is to go onto our website, uh, use the voter search tool and look up your voter registration. Make sure your information is current. That will also yeah. link you to a sample ballot um, and give you information about what districts you do um, reside in or, or that affect your uh, address. And so uh, with that, um, that's at ncsbe.gov. That's the voter lookup tool. Um, and you can get your own individualized sample ballot. Um, if you are an unaffiliated voter in North Carolina, then it's gonna show you all the available ballots. And when you go to vote, you, you check in and indicate which party's primary you wish to participate in. So that part's not quite individualized, but um, you know, the counties try to give you notice whenever there's changes uh, in your uh, your districts. And of course, we had changes in congressional uh, state house and state Senate for most voters uh, this year based upon some previous litigation. Uh, there have often been changes to North Carolina's uh, maps. And so that is one of those things that we definitely encourage voters to uh, check before each election so that they are familiar with what jurisdictions they reside in at this point. Great, thanks so much for that. And I wanna get into the primary a little bit because there's confusion and I'm sure in your, your line of work, you run across all sorts of levels of knowledge that people have with respect to uh, elections, general election, primary election, closed primary, open primary, <laughs> partial, and on and on and on. Uh, what basic information can you give us about the primary? Cause that's coming up soon. And again, folks want to have a plan. They need to be aware of what are the rules and, and, and uh, please get us up to speed on what they need to know. Yes. Well, the term applied to North Carolina is generally semi-closed primaries in that um, we do conduct the primaries for the political parties. And they if you're registered with a political party, then that's the primary that you'll participate in. That's the ballot that you'll be given uh, if you're unaffiliated as I touched on in the previous question, uh, an unaffiliated voter in North Carolina uh, goes into vote or when they select their app or request an absentee ballot, they indicate which party's primary they wish to participate in. You can only participate in one uh, party primary. So um, this does not change your party affiliation. You will remain unaffiliated, but you'll receive the ballot for the party that you wish to participate with. Um, this particular primary, we have a Democrat ballot, a Republican ballot, and a Libertarian ballot. If that's if you want, do not want to participate in any of those primaries, you will be offered a nonpartisan ballot if that is uh, available in your jurisdiction. Not everyone has nonpartisan contests uh, going into this primary. So uh, that's the general process. Uh, this also requires you to be uh, 
you know, if if you're not if you're registered, say a Democrat, and you want to participate in the Republican primary, you have to have changed your party affiliation. Uh, we we cannot switch out which party's primary you are participating in um, based upon your registration. It has to be the party that you're registered with. Um, the the time to update uh, voter registration ha is uh, February the 9th. That's what I wanted to just make sure I had that right date. So if you wish to change your party affiliation, you must do so by February the 9th. Um, and that's at close of business for your county board of elections for that to get processed. Uh, so that's generally how it works. Um, one little getting into the weeds asterisk is that North Carolina also is unique. Um, very few places have what's called a second primary. If one of the candidates in a contest does not get 30% plus one of a vote, um, then of the vote, then they can, uh, we can move into a second primary in that contest. Um, it's not an automatic. There's some, some requests and provisions that go along with that, but we could see ourselves in a second primary if no candidate gets 30% plus one of the vote in a contest. And in Many of our congressional districts, um, the, the lieutenant governor's race, for example, in one of the primaries, these contests, many of them have a lot of candidates who have filed. Um, and so we may very well see ourselves in a second primary. And if that's the case, we hold that 10 weeks after Election Day. So we're looking at uh, May 15th is the date if we were to have a second primary. And uh, the caveat to that, Michael, I'm sorry, I just realized mm -hmm. I didn't explain the importance of knowing that is so if you go in and you're um, unaffiliated and let's say you select the Republican ballot uh, for the primary, you uh, if you choose to participate in the second primary, you would continue to receive the Republican ballot because that's a continuation of the primary and it's allowing you to continue to participate in the party's primary that you had selected. Uh, if you went in, selected the Republican primary as an unaffiliated voter, and then there's a second primary for the Democrats, you can't receive that ballot because you didn't select it the first time. Now, if you're an unaffiliated voter who did not participate in the primary at all, but chooses to participate in the second primary, we don't see this very often, um, but you could at that point choose whichever party's primary ballot you wanted to participate in. Very good. Lots of great information there. Um, and uh, before we wrap up in the last couple of minutes here, I just want to highlight a couple of things folks may not be aware of. You know, most people think this information is good, but do older voters really need it because vo older voters are the most reliable voting block, right? As you see here, you look at the age groups, um, you know, 71 plus percent. Um, voting by age, very reliably going out, and and this is across the board, not just in general elections every four years, but in local elections, off-year elections, midterms, etc. Um, there is so much misinformation out there, folks, that it is so easy for people to get confused, even by just the basics, especially in a state like North Carolina, which obviously has have had some big changes and lots of legal challenges, and then more legal challenges. It's like the never-ending story here, right? Seems like a lot of job security if you are a lawyer specializing in in election law, but uh, so we we really make the effort to try to get this information to you. And all this year, we're going to be uh, doing our part to make sure that people have the information that they need uh, when it comes to voting, how to vote properly, what are the deadlines they need to know about, what are the rules. Um, so every vote is counted. Um, ARP does not have a political action committee that endorses candidates. We don't do that. Uh, we just want to make sure that uh, people have the information they need to get there and vote. Um, we do have a website dedicated to that. You'll see here they're scrolling on the, 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 uh, the Facebook Live feed right now. Please do visit it and check in with it routinely this year for, for more information. Um, Karen, I want to give you the last word here. If you could just highlight... Again, the important deadlines people need to know uh, coming up in the near future. Absolutely. So most of all, please go out and vote. And to learn more about voting processes in North Carolina, check out ncsbe.gov. It is the trusted source of information and it is a plethora of information and the election results. Uh, the other thing is just you know, decide now if you want to vote uh, absentee by mail, 
or early voting or election day um, and learn where those locations are if you're choosing to vote in person. And again, that's on our website. Um, early voting is February 15th through March the 2nd. Election day is March the 5th. We've already got absentee ballots that have gone out. So please, if you'd like to vote absentee by mail, make that request on our state board website, ncsbe.gov, or contact your county board of elections. Wonderful. Karen Brinson Bell, it's always good to see you. Thanks so much for all the, the great work that you're doing there. And, and we, we uh, look forward to continuing our work with the state board of elections to help educate voters uh, about these important changes and updates. Uh, great seeing Michael, you. Thanks for being with us. It dawns on oh, me. Of some of your uh -huh. uh, members are some of our most valuable poll workers. And I want to say one, thank you if you are a poll worker for us. And if not, and you're interested in giving back to the community that way, that's another thing you can do on our website through our Democracy Heroes campaign or to contact your county board of elections. So didn't mean to interject that, but I think that's an important part for this group to know too. Perfect note to end on for sure. Karen Brinson Bell, Executive Director of the State Board of Elections, thanks so much for being with us today, providing all this great information. Thank you, the viewers, uh, for watching and for your questions, and look forward to continuing this conversation as the months roll on. Great. Thanks again, everybody. Take care.